Now, why is this happening? Satellite assets are very important. Better models, higher resolution, and better data simulation. What we do with the observations to describe what's, what, you know, what's happening in the atmosphere. But one thing I want to make clear to you, all this is we've been, you know, increasing resolution, better models are not going to be enough. In fact, I'm going to suggest to you that the major revolution in numerical weather prediction will not be in the high resolution. That this could be another area that's going to be even more important. And I'm going to talk about that right now. So I, my prediction right now is there's going to be a transition from forecasting from what we call deterministic forecasting to what I'm going to term probabilistic forecasting. Now let me tell you what I mean by this. In a real way, the way, the way we've been forecasting up until now has been essentially flawed. Okay? We've been, in some sense, we've been lying to you. Meteorologists, you know, we're good guys, but essentially we've been lying to you for a long time. <laughs> And I'll tell you why. The atmosphere is what we call chaotic. It's a chaotic system. Which means that, you know, I remember I told you how numerical weather predictions stuff works. We start with an initialization, we describe the atmosphere, and our numerical models take it into the future. The atmosphere is chaotic, which means that small differences in the initialization, small differences in the starting point, well with an observational error, can have large impacts on the forecast. And these errors can grow and grow in time. And so the forecasting rate in time as you go into the future, small observational errors will grow in time until eventually the forecast is nonsense. Now, this is very similar to a pinball game, OK? Now, I've done this with my own kids. Now, the pinball machine's a pretty complex nonlinear system, right? Now, this is how it works. You go to the pinball machine, and you put your money in, and you don't touch the flappers. Okay? I've done this with my own kids, you know, so um, you can do this yourself. Put your money in, you get the balls come in, okay? Pull the, pull the plunger back to a certain point and mark it. Let it go, and it'll go ding, 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 and you'll get a score, right? Now, pull it back again, exact same place to the mark, and let it go, and it'll go, and it goes bing, 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 bing. What do you think your chances are of getting exactly the same score? 12%. Not 12%, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't too good. In fact, I've done this, uh, I, my kids really enjoyed this experiment. And, uh, and in fact, you know, it's pretty difficult. It's impossible to get the same score. And so small differences in the initial state that you can barely tell, you can't tell, it gives you a different score. Well, if you think this is a complex system, the atmosphere is a hell of a lot more complex than this. And so it's the same thing. We can't, we're not sure about the starting point. And so there's going to be uncertainties. <clears throat> now, not only do we have uncertainties in the starting point of our models, but there's, start, there's uncertainties in our model physics. How we describe the clouds. How we describe precipitation. How we describe radiation. They all produce uncertainties, you know? I'm, you know, I'm glad some of the global warming deniers are not in the crowd over here because if I, I, if I, boy, I, boy, I could tell them things that they, they'd love to know, that how the, some of the weaknesses of our models. You know, I, I'm a modeler, so I know them. And believe me, there are real weaknesses in our description of some of the physical parameterizations, like clouds, precipitation. So there's uncertainty from those. So the bottom line is all forecasts have uncertainty. And this uncertainty increases with time. And the way we've been forecasting the past is flawed. The way we've tended to forecast in the past is we put all our computer power, all our assets, to do one forecast. We put everything in there to do one really good forecast, and that's what we tend to go with. But this is flawed because there's a lot of uncertainty there. So now it's going to be the sensitive time there. So this is ridiculous. You know, again, I'm, I, I apologize to all the TV weather people in the crowd. You know? <laughs> Right? It's okay, it came five. It came five, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I my friend Jeff Ritter is not here. You know, they have five days and five days more because it's king five. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad they're not KCPQ 13 and at 13. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Jim Joyce is here. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm going to stop while I'm ahead here. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, to go in day six or something and say the high is going to be 42, the low of 27. Well, that's crazy, though, you know? I mean, the chance of it being exactly 42 is pretty slight, and the, the chances of it being 27 are pretty low, too, right? I mean, to say, to give a number is, is craziness, right? Or the weather service. Like, you know, it's the equal opportunity. I, I, the, the head of the Portland office is here, so. I mean, I mean, this is kind of nutty, too, you know. The exact highs would be 50, right? I mean, folks, we are, you know, our profession's lying. We're deceiving you. We're making you think things are more certain than they really are. And now I'm going to give you a shocking revelation to that part of the talk. There has never been as big a gap this is my own personal opinion, between what weather forecasters know and what we tell the public. Now, and I'll tell you how this is. Sometimes we have great confidence in our forecasts based upon all kinds of stuff we have and our model solutions, and sometimes we don't have confidence. And we often do not get this information to the public very effectively, okay? We have all kinds of toys and all kinds of models and all kinds of guidance that we look at. And we have all kinds of experience. And we really don't ex give you the information about the uncertainty very well. Okay? So this is not good. So what we need to do is change this. What we need to do is forecast probable disaster. We need, and, um, and we're just not talking about precipitation. All brown. We need to talk about probabilities of the forecast, or at least give you an idea of the range of possibilities. And fortunately, we have a technology that's rapidly developing that will allow us to do this, and this is called ensemble forecasting. Okay? And in fact, the University of Washington, I put a lot of computer power into high resolution, but I put more computer power now into ensemble forecasting. And the Weather Service is going in this direction as well. So how does this work? We have so much computer power today that instead of making one forecast, where we throw every, all the eggs into one basket, we make many forecasts. Not ten, maybe 10 forecasts, 50 forecasts, 100 forecasts. Each with a slightly different initialization, and each with maybe slightly different but reasonable model physics. And we can do this now because we have vastly increased computer power that we've never had before. We know that not only are the computer processors faster, we have more of them. The Weather Service now has 4,000 something processors, okay? Um, the European Center has twice as many. Um, and, you know, hopefully in the future they'll have 100,000 processors, okay? They should have. So, let me show you an example of ensemble. We run an ensemble system at the University of Washington. Here's an example of uh, a 12 kilometer resolution. In fact, we've had the highest resolution ensemble system in the U.S., I think, for a while. This shows you precipitation from this ensemble of different forecasts. I think this is a 36-hour forecast. And can you see that they're all a little different? They all started, you know, close together, but they ended up a little bit different, okay? We have an ensemble of forecasts. And so the question you may ask is, what the hell good is this? <laughs> well, it's really good. You can use an ensemble to give probabilities of any weather parameter you can imagine. For instance, simple-mindedly, if you have 15 ensembles, half of them say rain at a location, half of them say no rain, what's the probability of precipitation? 50%, right? Well, you can actually do it better than that, but you know, you get the idea, okay? But you can do that for temperature. Half of them are above 32, half of them below 32, you've got the probability of freezing, right? You can do this for any parameter. You can have probabilistic output. You can have uncertainties if you have an ensemble. Another thing that ensembles do is the, if you average these ensembles, the average, the ensemble mean tends to be more accurate than any individual member or any individual forecast uh, on average. Now, you know, some of any of you who have ever been in a forecast contest knows this. I don't know if you have a forecast contest for this uh, local chapter here. But if you average all the forecasters together, that forecast tends to be very skillful. Even in my 101 class, I have a forecast contest there, and I have all this, the students make forecasts. I average these forecasts of these people who are really relatively untrained, and it's amazingly good. So an average of an ensemble of forecasts can be very skillful. Now the other thing you can do with an ensemble is you can forecast forecast skill. 